Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the uh, 28th meeting in uh, 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome members and welcome our uh, witnesses who I will uh, come to uh, in a moment. Um, item one on the agenda, our members content that we take items five, six and seven in private. Great. That's great, thank you. Uh, item two, we're going to uh, take evidence in a roundtable format on creative uh, industries in Scotland. Uh, I think probably the easiest thing here would be uh, initially if we went round uh, the table and just, just introduced ourselves and said who we were. Um, my name is Murdo Fraser. I am the convener of the committee and I am member of the Scottish Parliament for Mid-Scotland and Fife. And I'll hand over to Dennis Robertson. And good morning. I am Dennis Robertson. I'm the deputy convener of the committee and I'm the SNP member for Aberdeenshire West. Mike McKenzie, SNP member for Highlands and Islands Region. Uh, good morning. My name's Brian Baglow. I'm the head of the Scottish Games Network and Games Partnership Manager for Creative Skillset. Trick Brody, SNP MSP, uh, one of the MSPs for the South of Scotland. Uh, David Archibald, I'm a lecturer in Film and Television Studies at the University of Glasgow. Margaret McDougall, I'm a Labour MSP for West Region. Fiona Logue, Director of Craft Scotland, the National Development Agency for Craft. Richard Baker, Labour MSP for North East Scotland. Gregor White, I'm Director of Academic Enterprise in the School of Arts, Media and Computer Games at Aberdeen University. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Gillian Berry, Co-Founder of Sigma Films and Founder of Film City Glasgow. Marco Biaggi, MSP for Edinburgh Central with just a little bit of a constituency interest in the industry. Georgina Follett, uh, University of Dundee, Director of Design and Action Knowledge Exchange Hub for the Creative Economy. Joan McAlpine, SNP member for the South of Scotland. Thank you. And we have uh, uh, the official report who are noting what is being said on our uh, clerks, Diggy Wands and Diane Barr. Um, right. Um, we've got about um, 90 minutes or so for this session. And really, I think it's an opportunity for us as uh, members to try and explore with our guests some of the issues around the creative industries. Mm -hmm. And I think the focus for us really today is to try and understand uh, where we are with uh, public support uh, for the industry, uh, what are the, the key issues of public policy that are currently supporting the industry or perhaps more interestingly holding it back, and if there were particular policy changes that you would like to see implemented, what these would, would be. And we've seen your, your written submissions, which are... Uh, uh, are, are very helpful in terms of framing, framing the, the, the discussion. Uh, we've got about 90 minutes. Um, I'll, I want to make this a kind of free-flowing discussion, but I, I'll, obviously I need to chair this in order that the broadcasting and official report can keep track of who's saying what. So if you want to contribute, if you just kind of catch my eye, uh, and I will bring you in, and if members want to ask questions of particular people, just catch my eye, and, and, and uh, I'll bring people in. Uh, as best I can, and let everybody get a, a fair crack of the whip. And if at any point you want to, you know, say something, just kind of put your hand up or try and indicate to me, and I'll I'll bring you in. Uh, I wonder if I could maybe just start off asking a question to to our individual witnesses, and maybe just let everybody make, get a chance to say, you know, just a little bit on the record, just to just to get things going uh, about you know general uh, public support for the sector. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot in the in the written submissions about the role of uh, Creative Scotland and the role of the enterprise agencies in supporting the sector. And I just wanted to get a flavour of um, what people think um, that is, whether they think that's been successful, is it sufficiently targeted, um, uh, how that might be improved. Maybe I can start with, 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 with Brian Baglow here and just work our way around the witnesses sure. on that particular issue. Mm, certainly. First of all, I have to say that the, the support from... Sorry. Right, should, should just don't say, press don't the buttons. Don't touch any buttons. Um, <laughs> you give they will all be controlled by pressed. broadcasting. <laughs> uh, right. Put my hands down here. Um, first of all, let me say that I, uh, the support for my own sector, the, the game sector, has been incredibly strong from the Scottish Government from the outset, uh, well before Westminster uh, agreed to table the tax breaks issue. The Scottish Parliament, uh, the Scottish Government, I should say, had uh, really thrown its weight behind the game sector and agreed that this would be of benefit to a very exciting and dynamic industry. Uh, 
The games industry itself has received a lot of support from the commercial industries, the commercial organisations, over the last two decades, from the very earliest days that Scottish Enterprise recognised the internet existed. The, um, they have really thrown their weight behind the game sector. And one of the main reasons that we have such a diverse and dynamic industry here in Scotland is thanks to the commercial organisations and the public sector support that we have. So I really can't fault them on that front. Um, however, because that predates uh, the, the formation of, of Creative Scotland, we kind of fell into the commercial only aspect of, of industry. Um, we had absolutely nothing to do with the Scottish Arts Council and we had only just, in the shape of myself, started talking to Scottish Screen as the merger process began. So we've not really had any of the legacy as a cultural or creative industry and in the sort of the last few years. So this is something that uh, we really have to address moving forward. And this is a, a UK-wide issue. Um, games, for the most part in the UK, are seen as things for kids. They equate to digital toys and therefore have very little, if any, cultural impact. Whereas, you know, my contention is that interactive media is fundamentally changing every aspect of the creative industries. At some point, somebody's going to need a programmer. Somebody's going to need to create something engaging and, dare I say, fun. And at that point, they should be coming and talking to the, the games industry because that's what we do. Maybe just to pick up on that, I'll go to Professor White next, just seeing as you're in more or less in the same field, and just see if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I agree with the, the, the history of, of games that, that Brian's described. Um, I think what the industry does very well is sort of reinvent itself every uh, in cycles uh, and responds, obviously, to, to technological advances and other uh, changes in the business models and things have been characteristic of that. Um, so I think you know there's a risk of, of lumping the games industry in under one banner. I think there's probably three games industries in in Scotland. Uh, you know, there's there's Rockstar North, which is its its own economy. Uh, there's a there's a kind of layer of, of companies that are reasonably well established now and have been running for some time and have a fairly steady uh, income stream and and know how to operate within the, the marketplace. And then there's that sort of startup layer, which uh, is is really very interesting at, at the moment. Uh, very dynamic, very high turnover, very difficult to kind of quantify, and uh, and manage in the sort of traditional ways that the public sector uh, agencies have worked with startup companies. Um, so I think there's there's a, a risk that we do damage through uh, the traditional ways that we look at startups. So you know, organisations like Business Gateway will will ask companies to establish themselves as a company and and go through bookkeeping courses and all sorts of uh, hurdles to jump over before they start to, to access these services. And the you know the people that are in that space are actually much more dynamic, much more fast moving than than that. Maybe not so interested in in uh, creating a business, much more interested in creating a product. So you know how we we cater for that that layer is a, a really interesting challenge for us at the moment. It's almost like the the R and D wing of the the industry, and and that's where the exciting things are happening. That's where they're working with. Uh, medics, that's where they're working with architects, that's where they're working with the oil industry, you know, they're, they're a much more kind of experimental uh, group of group of people at that level so, um, you know, I think that way of working is probably a more comfortable fit for Creative Scotland, I know they've had issues about sort of conceiving how games fit within their, their portfolio, but, but you know, that kind of community is much more familiar to them probably uh, organisations like the Cultural Enterprise Office also have had trouble fitting games into their, their Starter for Six program. Um, and, and, you know, that environment's a, a really rich one, a really interesting one. And I think if we kind of step back from saying, okay, you're a startup and this is the, the hoops that you'll, you'll jump through, uh, there's, there's a lot that can be done to support that, that sector in a different way. Um, the other side of the, the kind of agency that, uh, and public sector intervention is the, on the skills side. Um, I think you know the skills agenda has been dominant now for 10, 15 years in the game sector, driven mostly by employers. I would say you know large, large employers who are looking for kind of monofunctional 
graduates to enter the, a large corporation. Again, that, that landscape's changed completely now. The graduates need to be much more multifunctional, they need to be able to fit into small companies very well and be able to take up a number of roles within that company. So, so we see the, the graduate skill set changing and the demand for skills changing, uh, but you know we've still got this um, imbalance with the larger companies dominating that discussion about skills, and we're still getting this uh, this interpretation of what skills should be and what graduate skills should, should be from part of the industry that's actually now a tiny fragment of it. Okay, okay. a lot, lot of issues there. I'm sure you know, we'll want to, to follow up on that. I'm, I'm keen to just go round the table and let all the witnesses have a have an initial say. So maybe move on to film and, and, and Gillian Berry. Perhaps do you want to address the same question, Gillian, about uh, public sector support? And, how, how, do you feel that sufficient? What's your experience been of that? Um, I'm sure most of you will be aware of the film sector review that was published in, in January of this year. So I think that uh, everybody has a very clear idea um, of the state of the film industry in Scotland at the moment. Um, and of course, it was um, uh, prior to Creative Scotland, we had Scottish Screen, and there were 35 people looking after the film industry. Um, but for the last five years, there's only been, well, there's been less than a handful within uh, Creative Scotland, and although um, all of those individuals have, have, uh, have been fantastic, we, 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 there simply isn't enough, as many people as there should be looking after us, and, and Creative Scotland only look after the, the project side, production side of development, production of films. No one has looked after producer development or company support for the last five years and 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 therefore there is a crisis in the in the industry we still punch above our weight in terms of uh, international output and in terms of quality um, but the number of 100 uh, percent independent full-time producers stroke production companies in Scotland is probably, well, it is less than a handful now. We simply, um, you know, if, 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 if film is the cake and, and, and development is, is one of the main ingredients, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the, the, the cream and the sugar and, and, and we, you know, we're finding it, we're finding it uh, uh, very hard to survive. Okay. Okay, thanks. And maybe in the same vein, bring in David Archibald. That there's, a, there's a general there's a, the question of how Creative Scotland serves film but there's the general I don't know if you just want me to address that but there's a bigger mm. issue there which is about how Scotland fund, uh, relates itself to film and compares it to its comparison to its other and uh, to its neighbours and I mean I produced some statistics in that report which points out that Scotland spends less per person on film mm. per year than its uh, neighbouring countries Sorry, and, can I just check David is public spend or is that is box office spend? No, that's public state state, public spend. state, okay. state support. Yeah. Um, so I mean the comparison between Scotland and Denmark is, you know, even before last week, the Danish state announced that they were jacking up enormously. They were they, their increase is more than the annual Scottish spend, the total Scottish spend. So that's what you know. Scotland is a small nation, with which one of the things about Scotland speaking English is that has certain advantages in the international film market, but it has it has considerable disadvantages as well. Um, so in, compar in comparison to its neighbours, then you, one could argue that Scotland doesn't serve its film industry very well in terms of state funding. And I think what that means is that there's a disconnection between the amount of people who are very talented and who can make work. And the state, the state funding that they receive, and you know, I mentioned in there, there's a Royal Society of Edinburgh funded study which has identified recently a trend where uh, yeah, young people who are trained here are leaving Scotland because of the and it, because of the uh, the uh, the, uh, the opportunities are, the, are not there for them. So that's a broader creative creative Scotland cannot solve that problem. That's beyond the remit of creative Scotland. That's to do with funding. Um, in relation to creative Scotland, my my perception is that there's that um, among the filmmaking community, then they don't think that Creative Scotland is the best um, format for them to operate under, and that they would prefer if there was a dedicated film agency, which looked, uh, which could look at 
issues to do with commerce and issues to do with culture, and that they had one specific uh, organisation. Now, that, that, I can't, I'm not saying that that's my experience. I haven't dealt with them directly, but that's what I, that's what I would suggest that the, the Scottish filmmaking community, uh, that's, that, would be their, uh, that would be their main thing. I mean, just as a matter of interest, I mean, just go back to Gillian for a second, is that something you would agree with? Yes, we, we are the, the, the one of the only countries in Europe that doesn't have a dedicated screen agency, so absolutely. Um, I think th there, there is uh, work happening this week. Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland um, are joining the Independent Producer Scotland group at a workshop on Thursday to talk about and find ways for, for the, those two agencies to realign um, collaborate to help the film, the film uh, business. However, they they have very different agendas, and so uh, you know it's it's not impossible, but will take some work. Yes, please. I mentioned it there, but it's the question of a film studio as well, and it's just a, I'm mentioning the report in the, my report with my evidence that there's been considerable discussion about this in recent years. But actually, recently we found out that there was a Scotsman editorial in 1944 which <laughs> talked about the establishment of a film studio in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like if you look at studio development, and that's, so again, that's beyond the remit of Creative Scotland because they don't, you know, so that, that's something that the government has to address. I'm sure there are some members here who read that editorial at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking personally, I was not one of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a, it a very interesting point. In fact, one of the things on my list I wanted to come back and discuss later was, was the issue of the film studio, because that's been kicking around for such a long time. OK, before we move on, I want to bring in uh, Fiona Logue next, just to talk about this broad question of public support. OK. Um, the craft sector in Scotland comprises about 3,500 individuals who are working professionally as, as makers. Um, however, despite that small size of a group, it's not a homogenous one at all. And that leaves many of the people working in craft feeling sometimes uncomfortable about being placed in the creative industry sector. Many of them see themselves very much like an artist, producing one-off, fantastically designed, you know, wonderfully conceived pieces of art that will be bought by galleries and collectors. So they don't always see themselves as wanting to go into trade and production of multiples. And that's where the creative industry side comes in. And that's where we sit within Creative Scotland. It hasn't proved an issue so far in terms of funding. They do seem to be able to deal with the flexibility. And in the recent round of bursaries for creative people, six craft makers did get awards. So I think that despite where we sit, uh, you know, in terms of just making a, a distinction, that doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. We are pleased with the overall support we get from Creative Scotland and the service we get from them. Personally, Craft Scotland, uh, as an organisation that's 10 years old, um, has just received three-year funding for the first time, so I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, but that, uh, I think, shows uh, a commitment to the sector from Creative Scotland, and we're pleased with that, along with increased funding for... Uh, Northlands Glass up in, the, up in Wick in the north of Scotland, a new funding for the Duffcourt Studios in Edinburgh, which we're delighted about as well. Um, I think my challenge comes with some of the other agencies trying to work with them. There are huge opportunities for craft makers in things like tourism, for example, and trying to knock on the door of Visit Scotland and work with them about developing that as an opportunity to both add value to visitors coming to Scotland or indeed making a reason to visit Scotland has been incredibly challenging. Um, also in terms of taking work abroad, trying to get through the maze of Scottish Enterprise, SDI and UKTI, uh, I won't tell you the challenges that we have there. Uh, when we speak to people internally, they can't even help because they sometimes can't work out who's doing what. So um, again, uh, we find that challenging, not to create money for us, but to make sure that we're aware of all the opportunities that, they, that might exist in terms of trade missions or opportunities to go and see overseas, um, and just so that we could share that, uh, not necessarily for us to be doing it, but just so that we can make our sector aware of all the opportunities that exist. And just the other point might be on local authorities. Um, there's a bit of a... a postcode lottery there where some local authorities are very good at supporting crafts, so places like Fife 
um, where we have five contemporary art and craft. If you happen to live there, you'll get a great deal of support. Um, Dumfries and Galloway with the Spring Fling activities going on there and the recent work they've been doing through the Cabin Network have been excellent. But Edinburgh, Glasgow, there is no extra support in the major cities where most makers are, are situated. And I was trying to think, there's one other. The other bit about the postcode lottery is... Craft used to be a uh, long time ago supported by Scottish Enterprise and when it's changed its remit, its remit to the larger sectors, responsibility was passed to Scottish Arts Council and then to Creative Scotland. Highlands and Islands Enterprise still gives a lot of support to what they call fashion and textiles, but through an organisation called Emergence, um, they can support a lot of smaller craft makers perhaps people working in jewellery, which can be counted as fashion. So if you happen to be a jeweller living in the Highlands and Islands, you may be able to tap into two lots of support, i.e. from Highlands and Islands and also from Creative Scotland, whereas makers in the central belt can't. So for me, it's about joining up all those dots and all the potential opportunities that are there and just somehow making it all work much better. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Fiona. Um, and lastly, bring in Professor Follett. We take a slightly different perspective on the way in which we operate in that we work with all dis designers uh, irrespective of their discipline. So we have textile designers, games designers, designers from all across uh, Scotland. And what we do is we try and put design at the heart of new businesses. So we will scope a call, we will... Uh, hone in on a sector, we'll put a proposition up and then we'll bring a lot of people together, about 20, 25 to 35 people and we'll look at developing an idea and by placing in each team a designer. So the designer is there to help generate the ideas and move the agenda and really spark new thinking in the way of doing business. Um, the thing that we have found is that there is an absolute overwhelming need in the small, micro and small SME sector. It is absolutely enormous and insatiable in some ways. We have been deluged by over 500, I think it's now reached about 700 companies coming towards us because the complexity of the environment within which they're operating is so difficult for them to, to manage and manoeuvre that they simply can't get through the systems. You have to be quite a sophisticated business to know when to operate or when to access a particular training scheme. You have to have the resources to allow you out of your business. How do you run your business when you're going to go and do an accounting course or, or various other programmes that are on offer? They're there, but the means by which these small businesses can access them is limited. I think the other thing that we're experiencing as, as a, an organisation that is driven to bring businesses into the economy is that there is very much a STEM model being used for the way in which all of these organisations operate. So they're using very much a science uh, engineering uh, model, and they're not looking at the creative economy in a sympathetic manner or developing uh, a dual way of approaching funding for the different types of sectors. So everybody has to go through the same process. And it's easy if you're STEM because you have the, the, the kind of metrics that are needed for that uh, approach. And that is very much a uh, resource base, resource enhancement. Uh, bringing people in to do jobs whereas if you're in the creative economy you want much more mentoring it's much more person centric and it's a different type of model and there seems to be an unwillingness in, in we've just witnessed um, with the Funding Council and Scottish Enterprise who collaborated to bring innovation centres together uh, Creative Industries was in their first line of attack for, in first call and they have well, they failed round one, they failed round two because there wasn't the infrastructure in Scotland to support them because it needed to be led by a large industry. Well, the industries were all talking about a small and, and based on a small individuals, small companies, and so we didn't have the critical mass to make the bids work. Now, we know that the textile one has gone ahead, but it's gone at a very modest cost compared with the STEM subject. So it seems that... The creative economy is missing out on opportunities and ways in which it can build its infrastructure because the approach is not sufficiently sympathetic to our sectors. 
And, and so I find that very frustrating. And I just echo what all my colleagues have, have said in their frustration of joining all the bits together, not for us, but to make it work for the businesses that we're trying to, to grow and to ensure are there within the economy. Well, that's been a very helpful um, summary from, from all of you as to, as to where we are. I've got a number of members have already indicated to me they want to come in. I'll start with uh, Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, th there seems to be a sort of common theme, I think, from you all in, in, the, in, in the terms of there seems to be a very complex infrastructure that you seem to be trying to sort of work through. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I know that... Uh, uh, I think it was yourself, uh, Professor Follett, that, that mentioned the account management from um, Scottish Enterprise, the threshold of 400,000. Do you think that we should be looking at uh, ways of reducing the thresholds for people to get into account management and look at sort of removing some of the barriers um, for people to, to um, understand the complexity? Because it, it shouldn't be complex. I mean, there should be a portal, basically, that you should go through and you should be getting that ap uh, appropriate advice uh, um, to, to move forward, whether it be in crafts, uh, whether it be in film, uh, or whether it be in gaming, uh, in terms of accessing the appropriate funding. Uh, and there is a... Um, just recently, uh, just in the last few days, the um, open project funding from the government, um, I think it's 30 million over three years. And I'm just wondering if that's maybe uh, a source of funding that would be open um, to your particular sectors. Uh, Professor Follett first, maybe. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the open project funding in, and how to access it. I haven't had time to go in, into the depths of that. Sorry. Yeah. But... The, the businesses that we're supporting, we found that £20,000 with a very simple application form, say a one or two pager, uh, absolutely helps that business produce R&D and build itself into the economy. And keeping everything in one place, not making people move across agencies and across sectors. And we're finding we've got people who go from pillar to post. And so I think there needs to be a recognition that we have an economy based on very small-scale businesses and we need a methodology for them to access funding that is simple. So I would agree with you, absolutely. We need a new way in. <clears throat> is there a role for the Federation of Small Business to uh, assist in managing that process, do you think? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I... Yes, if they, if they can help, yes, if they can help, under, they know the problems, and, and so theoretically they could help design a system that gave access better. G Gillian Berry, I think, wants to come we, we, we have a similar problem in film, you're absolutely right, that the, this, this 400k threshold is um, impossible to, to, to meet to access the, the SE funding for the majority of the producers. So they suggested to us that we form a cooperative, which we did, Independent Producer Scotland, 40 members. Um, and we, uh, together with Scottish Enterprise, modelled um, the ideal infrastructure for, for the, the film sector. Um, and we applied to Creative Scotland regular funding. Um, sadly, our application for three million was rejected two weeks ago. Um, however, there is a possibility that we may uh, be able to apply through the regular funding, uh, the open funding or the targeted funding. Um, and, it, and it seems that when, when uh, the smaller businesses come, come together and act, behave cooperatively, it's easier to, to obtain the funding. Professor White. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't agree that there's a problem of, of companies accessing the agencies. Uh, last night, off the top of my head, I could think of 13, I could name 13 agencies in Scotland that, that in some way uh, purport to, to support the games industry. I think my, my record's 16, but I wasn't on form last night. Um, the, you know, the complexity that, that's been described about, about the sector is also part of its vibrancy. I think there's, you know, part of, of the balance that we have to find is you're not regimenting these creative people into to fit neatly into the sort of funding streams or, or, or profiles that, that agencies are comfortable dealing with. You know, so I think we need to, to, to live with that, that complexity and that dynamism. Uh, the games industry is obsessed with Finland. Finland seem to, to be getting it right at the moment. And, and part of what they do 
is incubate really well. So they incubate people and not companies. They, they have a great incubation space. So one person go in and you can hire a desk and sit down. If, there's two, if you need somebody to help you, you hire another desk, sit down. If you get to 10, you get thrown out, you get told to get an office. You know, and, and, and you, but you don't have to be accompanied to get into the building, which is, is one of the very important things. And it's very, very easy ac to access small amounts of seed funding for, for, the, for these. We could potentially look at. I, I think so. I think the, the, and the, the Finnish industry is great because they, have a, they had a large uh, technology company as well who were very interested in investing in the, the infrastructure as well. So Nokia put a great deal of money into the, to that space, and that's maybe something that we don't have in Scotland as part of that ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Marco Piaggio. The area I had wanted to cover has slightly been covered because I, was I had noticed that Scottish enterprise had almost been conspicuous by its absence from the comments from film and, and gaming. But I wonder if maybe I could go into a, a slightly different topic. And that, that was actually to pick up on something that was in Professor Follett's submission, which was about research and development in creative industries. Now... I understand quite easily what research and development is in the life sciences. What actually materially is research and development in the creative industries? Shall I? <laughs> research and development in the creative industries for individuals is obviously different, but what they're trying to understand if they're trying to run a business or a get, gain a living from the creative economy is how they can function, what their skills will enable them to, to leverage, how they can make their businesses work. So they need access to world-class experts. They need access to uh, a problem, a real business opportunity. So for a small business to, to find its own market, that's quite complex. So if what we're doing is scoping a market... So if they come into us, they have immediately an opportunity to create a business that has a market for it. So they need research to understand where the market opportunities are, where the, the business opportunities are, what are the new business models, because business models are quite limited at the moment, and we're seeing a transition, if you like, from a push economy to a pull economy, where we're seeing very much more service industries develop and um, there's no real business models for them to grasp. So they need research in hope it, helping them to build appropriate models for the kind of businesses that they want to deliver. So those are the, the, the main things we found from working with all these individuals, is they need a business opportunity, they need to understand it, they need opportunity to talk to experts and really understand the platform that they're planning to deliver to. And then they need help building business models that enable them to flourish. I just wanted to give one very practical mm. example of research and development. I've been fortunate just to come back from Chicago, where we took a, a group of uh, 13 art makers to a large international exhibition called SOFA, Sculptural Objects and Functional Art. Now, we... Uh, selected the makers through open selection they had to, to apply for it and then we had a, a, an external selection panel so the makers knew back in February that they were going to this exhibition part of the, the selection process was why they wanted to go, why they thought it was important to the development of their work, many of them want to access the US market but in order to really make a show there, they've, they, they had to, m many of them had to up the game in terms of the work that they were producing because the work is larger, uh, it has to be more developed, it has to be right for that market. So that group of 13 people have been spending time since February until the work was shipped in September, creating a whole new body of work that would be right for that market. And so that's the type of research and development that needs to happen. It's a kind of, it can be an internal thing as well in terms of the quality of your own work and the direction it's going in, as well as the external thing about business. Uh, interesting to get public funding for that. We got money, Creative Scotland Creative supported Scotland. us, okay. but the artists, many of them had to fund their own passage there. Okay. I wonder, is there, industry-wide, are there enough incentives and pressures, positive ones, to ensure that kind of constant re-examination of what you do and, and pushing innovation forward, or is it the case that some could coast and, and not not be challenged by that? I mean, I, I guess in your industry it would be... 
as individuals. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the yeah. desire to, to innovate yeah. uh, and progress has to come from the individuals yeah. themselves. If they don't have the passion and the drive to do it, it will, will never happen. And I suppose what we do want to do is make sure that the environment is right to support those who, who want to make that move. And yeah. there are, is some funding in place, but more could be encouraged. I, I, I guess that's something that's inherent in your industry, but yeah. perhaps in, in gaming there might be a tendency for some to do what an American might call cookie cutter industry, just Very much so. plugging um, stuff out. And the game sector is notable for, you know, the one constant is, is evolution. New devices uh, appear on the market all the time, new technologies, which spur not only new types of content, but new routes to market, new business models, and entirely new audiences. Um, you know, the entire games industry changed fundamentally in July 2008 because Apple launched the App Store. All of a sudden, instead of needing a large team, millions of dollars up front, two guys in the back bedroom could sit together and knock, you know, knock a game out that would stand just as much chance of making money as something like Grand Theft Auto. Um, and this is, this is the challenge that the games industry specifically is facing, which is that the industry as a whole is running to stay still. Um, we're constantly being pushed forward. Uh, as Gregor said earlier, there are, there are almost three distinct games industries. The one that everyone tends to think of is the console market, the Xboxes, Playstations and Nintendos. That's a vanishingly small percentage of the industry in the UK and an even smaller percentage of the industry here in Scotland. Most of the companies out there now are looking at the, the new opportunities, the new routes into market, which have much lower barriers to entry and offer you know, almost as many rewards. But it comes down to actually understanding the devices, the routes to market, the new business models. You know, the games industry is in an, is almost schizophrenic at the moment because when games work, they work incredibly well. Grand Theft Auto V, for example, the, the month that was launched last year, the same month it made more money than the global music industry averages. You know, it made a billion dollars in three days. It has, to date, made more money than Avatar, Titanic and the last two Harry Potter movies put together. Uh, Minecraft has revolutionised how families and children feel about video games. You know, no explosions, no headshots, no rescuing princesses. Instead, it's creativity, it's almost digital Lego. But those are very much the exceptions. And we have a growing number of companies now that are trying to understand an increasingly saturated market and find ways to innovate and differentiate themselves from the hundreds of millions of creators that are out there in the world today. You know, so the, the, the console market is almost um, a red herring. That's a given, in a way. Uh, in Scotland, certainly, according to our own research, about 94% of the companies that are based here are doing casual social mobile and online games and those are still evolving incredibly rapidly you know in 2012 facebook was going to be the biggest platform for gaming in the world didn't happen you know because of one company managed to you know basically break it for everybody else um, but for me this comes back to a very very fundamental issue which is that people get into the games industry and i suspect into the rest of the creative industries because they want to create you know, people get into the games industry, they want to make games. Running a company is a byproduct. And as a result, we have a number of people who have succeeded, you know, despite the not knowing a huge amount about business or they've made their business work over the last 10 or 15 years. But we're not innovating. And one of the things that we, we, we suffer from in comparison to Finland is um, a lack of business skills on the creative industries. You know, we don't have too many people who are going out there going, you know what, maybe free-to-play is not an evil monster that's going to kill all games and mean that we die penniless and alone in a bus shelter. Instead, if that's the reality, how do we innovate? How do we make use of this and find ways to actually make it work for us? But the reason that we're not having the, the international financiers coming in, the venture capitalists coming in, to the UK as a whole, but Scotland specifically, is that very, very few of the companies in my sector, certainly, are investment ready and are very unlikely to be so in the near future. As, as, as the parent of a six-year-old and five-year-old, I just want to agree completely with everything you said about Minecraft. Uh, Grand Theft Auto is not on the agenda, but mine, Minecraft certainly is. Uh, Chick Brody, I think, wants to follow up some of this. If, if I may, good morning. 
Um, just on the, the last point, mm -hmm. Brian, uh, by the way, I have to say that uh, I was surprised looking at the figures that over 50% of the jobs in, in creative industries are in uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. As a proud Dundonian, I'm surprised that we're not, we don't feature uh, more largely. In terms of you, you said running a company is a byproduct, and of course we need innovation. Uh, the problem, though, is if I look at some of the numbers that we, that we have in terms of, of uh, very small uh, businesses, um, how do we qualify what should, or who qualifies, or should we be qualifying the products that come forward in a much more meaningful way uh, so that f funding is much more focused than it currently is, because it seems to be almost anarchy out there trying to, you know, in terms of how funds are distributed. Well, mate, specifically on the games side of things, um, there's no funding out there. Uh, all of the companies that are out there right now, and there are probably about 90 plus in, in uh, Scotland at the moment, uh, more than 50% in Dundee, you'll be delighted to hear, uh, most, the vast majority of the games that are coming out of Scotland um, are self-funded in some way. They're either bootstrapped, they're from companies that are using the, the proceeds of their previous game in order to finance them, or they're making use of um, their own funds. There are very few companies that are bringing in any kind of finance. But so following that on, I mean, one of the comments, I think, I'm not sure who made it, uh, Gregor, I think, in terms of business skills, I mean, I, innovation is great and we have the creativity, uh, but at the end of the day, you may say it's a byproduct, but unless there's substantive business skills, and you know, why we've got people who are creating mm -hmm. products are running off to do accountancy courses, it surprises me. And why are the business skills there? Is the knowledge of the industry there where you can get business mentoring? Are business gateway doing the job they should be doing? Do they understand the industry? Uh, and the same applies to Scot uh, Scottish Enterprise. Uh, well, if I may jump in again, um, I think one of the issues is that there is an awful lot of support and opportunities out there. But as um, Gillian and Gregor have both highlighted, you could spend your entire working life just finding out who's out there. Um, at my last count, there are 35 organisations, public sector and otherwise in Scotland, that are involved in the game sector in some way. 35? From 35. From talent How many Scotland's of them overlap? Well, that's a very good question. If you can help me find out. Um, yeah, you know, we go across the board from Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Development International, Cultural Enterprise Office, um, Creative Scotland, oh. Arts and Business Scotland, Talent Scotland, that was a new one on me, um, you know, BAFTA Scotland, Creative Skills Set. It's we've got was on display at Hilton Park last night. Yeah. I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that I might say something unfortunate. Um, but it, there, uh, there is support out there, and we, uh, we do actually have a lot of organisations that can help people go out and set up their businesses. Um, Business Gateway actually do a fantastic job. The reason we've grown from six companies in 1997 to close on 100 in 2014 is because Scottish Enterprise and Business Gateway are, are fantastically good at helping businesses start up. It's how those businesses are then incubated, again, thank you, Gregor, through to actually being successful and commercially viable. That's the issue. And I think at the moment, for me, one of the biggest issues is where does Scottish Enterprise stop and Creative Scotland start? What does Skills Development Scotland do? It's like, where does Talent Scotland come in? And all of these different organisations have different offerings. But if anybody here can you know, point me to a map that shows what they all do and how, they, how it works and how it links together, I would be absolutely astonished. Professor Follett wants to come in. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with you. It's the commercialisation of the idea that is the real issue for the, these businesses. They, they, they have the, the skill sets to produce the ideas, to prototype them, and, and to get them, if you like, to a stage pre-commercialisation. I mean, it's the infrastructure to commercialise their products that is, is the big gap in the market, and how they take that idea, and, and they're very good at creating one or two or ten or fifteen, but how do they create... 10,000 or 100,000 pieces. That's, that's the gap in knowledge. And helping those companies get that expertise into them is, is very difficult, which is why I think the route we've been taking is to try to partner them with, a, with, a made, with another business so that they can learn from people who are already in the marketplace. So I think mentoring is a really helpful 
system, but we don't have enough mentors, if you like, to help with the commercialization, nor do we have any experts who actually help with this commercialization process. And, and, it, and it's, it's where we probably lose 80, 90 percent of our capacity well, that at that point. point. I mean, there's no point in having a business mentor no, unless you have over. some understanding of the product or the service you're offering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it falls hmm. over at that point. Yeah. Can I just one last question yeah. I mean, uh, of, of uh, uh, Gregor? In your paper, uh, I find this quite interesting, uh, having spent some time at Sanford uh, University in California, you, you, you have the prototype fund, is that right? Oh, the Albert A. University yeah. has, yes. Uh, in it, in, in the briefing we got, or until very recently. it says you, you provide grants of up to 25,000 pounds for small companies. Yeah. But Albert A. University doesn't take ownership of any IP or equity created during the project. Why not? Um, it's, it's very difficult to exploit IP. Uh, certainly, uh, as far as prototype was concerned, as opposed to the, uh, the university itself, um, obviously these were startup companies that, that came into the space and, and with existing IP and, and you know, that IP may have been tied up into other sorts of relationships as well with a, uh, a publisher or, a, uh, or partners with, within that. Um, so it's very difficult to exploit IP. IP in the, the game sector, you know, as a, as a larger idea, is, is very, very difficult. IP, yeah. if you're handing over £25,000, I mean, that has to be a negotiating point. The, the, yeah, the, I, I didn't run prototype as a, as a project. As I right. understood it, there was a, 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 a clause within the agreement that expected a contribution back from the companies should they go into profit and should they go into profit in a significant way, then uh, there was a... Uh, gentleman's agreement, I think, rather than a <laughs> rather than a commitment to uh, reinvest it in prototype as as a whole. I, I can actually chip in because um, there was an agreement. Uh, so if you actually received one of the prototype funds, the expectation was that if, there, there, as Gregor was saying, there's zero value in untested IP in the games market. There is potentially value in a prototype. So the notion was to help people create the prototypes that could then be sold should they come to market and make, have any sort of commercial success. There was an expectation that the money would be paid back towards the fund itself. Yeah, I just find, I mean, I find it difficult in, in lots of areas where public money is invested in, in so-called winning products mm -hmm. uh, and the return is you might get the loan back, uh, but I'd much rather see an equity where there's a greater return on public Oh, I, I agree. Or cycle. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you recycle the money, but when you get the money back. That would go back into the project and, and be used to support for future projects. Okay, thank you. There is, there is an issue with IP for small companies. Yes, we take a share of the IP or we take an equity share in the company that we birth, one or the other. But for the very small companies, and, and we've spoken to, to really quite large companies, middle-sized enterprises, actually protecting your IP is really difficult in the marketplace. So we've got, we use the university as an IP shelter for the companies that we invest in and we support mm. because the university has quite sharp elbows. So if somebody treads on the toes of that company, we can use the university to, to deal with the legal aspects of that because I think for small companies, it's beyond their wherewithal to actually uh, take them, take them uh, to task about it. I mean, we, we've seen Apple have problems and Samsung and Nokia and everybody else, so it is a difficult area. Is protecting IP. Briefly. Right. Very, very briefly. Yeah. Um, just again, from the game's point of view, we're creating more original intellectual property now than we ever have in the past. In 2013, Scotland produced 93 games, um, 86 of which were based on original new intellectual property. Um, and Minecraft and GTA aside, if anyone can name me five, I've got a £20 note for you. Um, so it's not so much the creation or even the protection of IP, it's the exploitation of it and the commercialisation of it, again, which comes back to the, 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 the business skills in order to do, make those things work in a global market. Sure. Sure. Okay, um, I think next on my list is Alison Johnson. Um, thanks very much, convener. I think i um, really enjoying hearing the evidence this morning. Some of it is uh, very well presented and, <laughs> and entertaining, and we're learning a lot. Um, I feel... That we're hearing a lot that's really exciting. There's obviously massive, massive potential in all these industries, but also what I'm hearing is very, very frustrating indeed, because it seems we're not we're not joining the dots. There's a lot of disconnect. 
And if we could just get our act together, I think there's huge opportunities for individuals, for the economy, you know, lots and lots of, of opportunities. So I probably want to focus um, perhaps on the craft side and, and on the filmmaking. I think um, you were suggesting that Edinburgh and Glasgow, their sort of investment in crafts, their, their interest in it is lagging behind other parts of the country. And when you think that Edinburgh is sort of world known for its arts festival, it seems like a real shame. And it wasn't until you said that I thought, I was a councillor um, in Edinburgh for five years, and, and now that you've mentioned it, I don't think we discussed crafts once and the impact it could have. And obviously when the festival's going on, there's lots of crafts that you see as you wander up and down the high street. But it clearly could be a lot, lot better. So I probably would quite like to hear from Fiona um, and from yourself, Gillian. Um, you know, we heard that uh, you suggested that film was in crisis in Scotland. Um, David, you were saying that the Danish increase was more than the entire Scottish spend. And we can see the impact that, that Danish filmmaking has had. You know, we're... We all discuss it probably regularly on a, on a Monday morning when there's when there's something on a Saturday evening. So I'm probably just looking for one recommendation from you both. Is it a national agency? And in crafts, is it for each local authority to be investing in this area properly and making themselves aware of the opportunities? Shall I start? Um, you're right, in Edinburgh, during the festivals, you see a lot of stuff on the streets. I would hesitate to call it craft, I'm afraid. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, some of it is very, very poor quality, and I think that damages professional craft makers. A lot of these people are selling the work at prices that are just... I, I, I don't know how they sustain themselves. So a lot of people doing it as a hobby. A lot of people, it's mass-produced. It's uh, a mug that's mass-produced in China with a transferred printed image of Edinburgh Castle on it, and people are buying it as a souvenir of Scotland. And I find that very upsetting. I know that there's been lots of looks into all the uh, tartan tat shops in the high street, and I would echo... Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> and so I think that there is a real challenge for makers who are producing quality pieces of, of handmade work, which inevitably, with locally sourced materials, sustainable materials, which you know, may have taken day, uh, days to make, and people look at it and think that they're expensive. And they may be expensive in comparison to the, you know, the mass-produced mug, um, but in comparison to how much time and... IP and everything else that's gone into it, it's incredibly cheap. Um, and so I think that's a challenge. It's a conversation I've had to, tr I've tried to have with both the authorities in Edinburgh and Glasgow as the two major cities. I have tried to have conversations with um, the, the, the people in, who head up uh, arts and, and leisure. Uh, just to get it on their agenda, that's part of my job. Uh, Craft Scotland is a very small organisation. There are now five of us. Um, and I spend most of my time just out talking to people, trying to raise craft onto people's agenda. And so far, have been fairly unsuccessful with both of the major cities. They listen to me, but they kind of say, they pass me down the chain and say, we'll have an exhibition here or go and speak to this person there. I have to be fair, in both of those cities, they do have a small... Um, arts and craft bursary scheme that's matched by Creative Scotland. Now, I don't know how much it is, but it's probably a few thousand pounds. So I can't say that they do absolutely nothing. Um, but in terms of exhibitions in their galleries, uh, there's nothing. The Museum of Edinburgh, it's all old craft applied art. There's wonderful examples of silver, of glass, of, of ceramics that's been produced in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Go and try and see some wonderful glass ceramic that's been produced in the 21st century and you would struggle in either of those cities. And that's, I think, one of the challenges for me. Uh, we are trying to use... There is a huge infrastructure of galleries all around the country, you know, whether it's the McLaurin Art Gallery in Ayr or uh, the Dick Institute in Kilmarnock, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, there are lots of galleries. And so I've, I've set up a, a craft curators network trying to bring together the people that run the infrastructure cultural infrastructure, to see if th there's more we can do to support craft. There's obviously links here with tourism, very strong links that we should be building on. And clearly this affects, you know, those of, <laughs> you know, people use jargon like Brand Scotland. But if you're a tourist and you take home a, yeah, something that 
it clearly doesn't have any longevity at all. It, it does reflect badly. Is this something that you discuss with Visit Scotland? Try to do that. But what I will tell you is one great success, actually, um, and that's with the National Trust for Scotland. Uh, yesterday, uh, we, together with the national buyer for the, the National Trust properties, of which there are um, the National Trust shops, uh, we're putting a joint project together to have a Craft Scotland collection of work in their shop. So their head buyer is absolutely fantastic, understands that the people who are visiting National Trust for Scotland properties want to buy an original piece of work from Scotland. And so hopefully that new collection will be in the shops in May. So having proved the concept, I hope to roll that out to other people like Visit Scotland and Historic Scotland, but it's wading through mud. <laughs> But it certainly sounds like a discussion we need to have with the National Tourism Agency. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, can I just go on to... to yeah, that's just sure. Fiona, just yeah. that's all right. this point. Um, do the universities have a specific role in actually um, a, a sort of showing off the, what, what they've created in, in terms of their galleries? I'm thinking of the two art schools, obviously. I mean, obviously, Glasgow and Edinburgh are, are probably the, the two best um, design and art schools we have in Scotland. Uh, I'm sorry to graze. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry to grease. <laughs> I'm probably uh, going to. Uh, uh, my educational colleagues might, around the table might disagree with me here, but I, I have a big concern in that actually uh, specialist courses in craft have now been removed from most of the, the Scottish art schools. There still is a glass course in Edinburgh, but if you're to look for a specialist ceramic course or a specialist weaving course, those have all been removed through the, over the, the last several years. So I have concerns about where the next generation of... Well, we're awash with jewellers and that's... Yeah, okay. We're awash with them and the reason the colleges still do that is it's very cheap for them because it's a small workbench and some small hand tools. You don't need to run a kiln yeah. Uh, and so I really do worry about where the next generation of, of exciting crafters are, are coming from. Thank but they, yeah. they do show the work in terms of uh, graduate shows, and a number of them do have some very good uh, residency programmes for people who are out of the education just for a couple of years and giving them access to facilities, because that's one of the largest challenges for people. Awesome. Sort of drill down into why we're not taking the opportunities that investing in film will return because I understand that investment has a fantastic return. You know, for every pound spent in, in film, we, we get 20 odd pounds back, I believe. So th there are huge opportunities, and we don't seem to be getting a grip. So I just wondered what. If, if we were to do one thing, what is it? Is it this National Film School? What, what do we need to do? I think, I think a, a dedicated screen agency would be fantastic because the synergies between film and screen uh, should be encouraged and explored. Um, we're at least five years behind both Northern Ireland and Ireland now. Um, Ireland produces at, at least 20, usually 22 feature films a year, and we're, we're only about five or six Return on investment completely varies depending on, for example, Game of Thrones. For every pound invested, there's there's eight eight pounds return, but that's because it's concentrated in a studio. Um, uh, sometimes in coming uh, production, the, the economic return is less because the production is transient and, 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 and disappears uh, before you know it. Um, dedicated... Uh, screen agency would be great. In the in the meantime, uh, you know, John John Swinney asked for an immediate realignment of of the government agencies, Creative Scotland and SE. Um, after our meeting with him back in March, I think it was. Um, so we're, we're we're still very hopeful um, that that we're going to see that and that and that SE can can really come in and start doing some immediate uh, repair work um, to, into the infrastructure. Um, on the on the wish list, of course, the, the film studios, as, as as you know, we've mentioned earlier on, um, it would be uh, since we've spent you know seventy years talking about it, you know, I think we. <laughs> We need to put it in the right place, and uh, you know, if it's not surrounded by an infrastructure, 
the odd hotel, a decent cup of coffee, a restaurant, mm-hmm. airport, even you know some facilities companies, mm-hmm. then you know it's it's uh, it's not likely to succeed in the middle of nowhere. So that would be my my major point. Yeah, yeah briefly, because we watched time. I hear, I hear the issue in terms of the studio, but what discussions have you had with the major tele- television companies? Because if I look at the BBC studio, which I understand is not used a lot, I mean, have you had any discussions at all about util- utilising any of their infrastructure? Yes, their the, the, uh, Scottish Enter- Enterprise undertook a feasibility study and they looked at over 300 locations in Scotland, including all the existing facilities. Um, and they're still in the process of due diligence <coughs> And we're hoping that we'll hear something from them soon. So, um, sorry, Alison. Yeah, um, just finally, convener um, David Archibald, you suggested that we needed to up our game in terms of film education in this country. That I think eighty percent of pupils in Denmark enjoy film education. Is it about twenty-five percent here? What difference do you think that would make if if our pupils had that opportunity? I think well, I think children are entitled to a, a, a richer cinematic experience than they might get in Cine World, uh, for instance. And um, it's one of the problems that Scottish cinema or filmmaking in Scotland has in terms of exhibition that it has to compete with enormous economies of scale. So sometimes, even when someone makes a great film, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a successful su- successful film. And I think at, at uh, primary and secondary school level, if children were introduced to a wider range of cinematic material then they might develop tastes in that, and therefore when they were older they might be much happier to go and see successful, small-scale, experimental, or, 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 or less blockbuster material. So I think it's important. I also think in terms of education it's important that people have, uh, get to experience stories that people uh, that people here make so that we understand who we are. Um, so that's so at, 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 at school level, it's important. I also raised the idea in that paper. I've raised it previously about the idea that there should be a national film school in Scotland. That it's in higher education, most students who most people who want to go to film school still go to film school in England. Uh, and although there, there is an organisation called Screen Academy Scotland, which exists in Edinburgh, it doesn't have, in my opinion, the oomph of a national film school. Um, and there's been big changes in, in film education and higher education institutions. There's a lot more happening. There's a lot more practical courses being taught at postgraduate le- level. And I think there would be, and I raised the idea at the Edinburgh Film Festival this year, that it would be interesting to explore the possibility of having a national film school without walls, which tapped into the talents, of the, take, the, the talents and skills, considerable talents and skills of people in Edinburgh, Glasgow and, the, and in the University of the West of Scotland and I think that that's definitely worth uh, definitely worth exploring. I just want to make one other point, which is about cultural value of cinema. Um, I mean, last week there was a film called The Possibilities of Endless. Uh, the possibilities are endless, or endless, I can't remember actually. The possibilities are endless and it, was, uh, and it received a five-star review in The Guardian and it's a s- very s- small film, documentary film, about Edwin Collins and his struggle, uh, his struggle to produce music and, and after having uh, after after having uh, uh, illness, and I think that uh, one of the things that film can do. I'm not saying that games can't do it. I'm not saying that other 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 art forms can't do. But documentary cinema is a, is fantastic for showcasing other aspects of, of culture in Scotland. Uh, there's another a, a documentary which is in the pipeline about the work of Alistair Gray. He's obviously got the big retrospective at the Kelvin Grove at the moment. So, so, so cinema can be really... So there's the commercial end of cinema, and cinema has to negotiate at the industry, but there's a, there's a cultural value in cinema as well, uh, which, is in, in, uh, which is worthy of investment. And, you know, perhaps the possibilities of endless, because it's so low budget, it may actually end up making money. There are, there's a filmmaker in, in Edinburgh, Mark Cousins, who... Is perhaps more well known as a critic, but who kind of operates under the, the radar of funding, but actually has been quite uh, been quite successful. But my, perhaps my favorite market more money than more people would see his work because it's a problem. Not it's, it's not just a problem about making work. If you don't have a significant uh, investment to market it, then nobody can maybe see your film. Um, Gregor wanted to come in, and then Brian. Well, need, need to be brief, please. Cause just a very brief comment. I, uh, I have a visiting role at the film school in Copenhagen, and I've spent some some time over there. And it's a, it's an extraordinary place, but it's very lavishly 
uh, funded. It's not part of the education system, it's part of the culture department and it's funded through the, the culture department and it's a, a five-year postgraduate uh, program and, and students work in production teams for five years and create a number of productions over that, that period. So you know, I, I won't vouch for the, for the joys of being part of the culture department rather than the education department, but you know, they, they see it as part of that investment package that they've put in place recently is the education of the next generation coming through as part of that responsibility. Okay, thanks. Right. Uh, just very quickly, I think there's a, a couple of very good points that, that you brought up there. Um, the first, David, is that um, get your filmmakers to come and talk to us. We can get stuff seen on iPads and iPhones worldwide. I know the sanctity of the cinema-going experience is a, is a really good thing, but in terms of a global audience, you know, we're there. Um, which brings me on to the second point, very brief, I promise, which is the bigger issue here is I think we need to stop thinking about uh, the industries in terms of silos. You know, yep. film and games are becoming a lot closer. Visual effects, animation, you know, all of the creative industries in some way are now having to come to terms with the realities of digital and interactive devices on the market. And I think one of the dangers, one of the issues that we've had is that film is treated entirely separately. You know, games has had a a legacy issue of being, you know, the awkward kid in the corner that nobody wants to talk to. Um, so I think moving forward, we absolutely have to recognise that we're all converging, that everybody needs to be talking to each other, because we want to learn from the film sector just as much as I think the film sector can hopefully learn from us. Okay. Marco, did you have a yeah, brief follow-up? On, on film, we had Finland cited as an example of good practice and gaming and what it does and Denmark is one that we've heard a lot about for film is there a tension or is there a, a, a junction whereby you can go down a Danish route and emphasize culture but there are other models out there that are more commercial like Ireland. the Canadian provinces Ireland New Zealand which I would guess would be probably in pure financial terms most successful and is there a policy choice there is there a divergence there or is it possible to be both I think it's possible to be, to be both, absolutely, yeah. The, so what should we do? What should we do? <laughs> I, think, I think that uh, given, given that uh, Ireland is, is so close and they have put so much time and effort into developing a strategy that's clearly paid off, um, you know, it would be a model that we, 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 we should look at initially. Um, and... Uh, and well, alongside explore explore the other models, um, you know, it's it's not it's not rocket science. I don't think. I think if 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 there were a task force uh, empowered to you know uh, develop a strategy for the film industry that would transform it, you know, within a couple of years, I think it could quite easily be done. It's been done before. The, the, the considerable investment that they made in the Danish film industry was supported across the political uh, board. That it wasn't, it wasn't left to state, and it wasn't left to state intervention. Um, and I think that it attempts to straddle both cultural and economic. And I think, you, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on the, da the, Danish, the Danish film industry, but two things are interesting, which is that, you know, a few years ago, and Gillian will know more about this than I do, but t uh, a few years ago they made, the Danish film industry made a strategic decision, or people involved in the f Danish film industry made a strategic decision to attempt to move into English language co-productions, which they did very successfully with Sigma, um, uh, Gillian's company, but also if you look at the success of their television industry, in terms of the cultural products that they will be exporting, which are very good for the Danish tourist tourism industry, and will be very good for uh, the Danish economy. So, you know, I would, uh, it would be certainly worth looking in more uh, drilling down, as they say, in considerably more detail to how they've managed to do that, seemingly very successfully in Denmark, to the point that they're, uh, that they're deciding to spend more money. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We do need to finish the session at half past 11 because we have the minister coming in on another on another matter. So we are short on time. A number of members haven't spoken yet. So I want to start with Margaret McDougall. Thank you. Um, I find uh, this morning's session very interesting. I, and I mean, I think there's a theme coming across that if perhaps there was more collaboration between the different industries within the creative industry that, you know, because you can help each other and even, you know, smaller businesses 
can help each other, as uh, Georgina has said. Uh, my question is around um, crafts and uh, on this collaborative working, because uh, I noticed you, you mentioned uh, Fife is a good place to be, or was it Dumfries? Yeah. And, uh, but we have one craft town in Scotland, in West Kilbride, which happens to be in my area. And um, so why isn't there more craft towns in Scotland? Because it seems like a, a good idea and, you know, they've got a specialist niche, niche in the market, um, from what I understand. And it was really just, why hasn't that rolled out across the country? I'm not sure I really know the answer, but I know that Craft Town Scotland and West Kilbride came about because of very much the passion and energy of one individual, Maggie Broadley, who's worked incredibly hard to make sure that it happens. And I think that's so often the case, uh, that um, it's a, a lovely model, uh, the fact that they're within that small town which was fairly run down that the high street still needs some improvement that many of the empty shop units were bought um, through support from the, the Muffet Trust I believe and uh, handed over to a local organisation and the, a number of makers have moved in and they can now have cheap access to studio space on condition that they open their studios to the public at the weekends. At the same time, the Barony Centre, which was an old church, has been converted and turned into a lovely gallery. Part of the challenge there is that, to be <coughs> honest, we've been trying to work with them on the tourism project, but unfortunately it's in a part of the country that many of the tour operators just don't want to go to, and it's not quite enough of a pool. There's not enough else happening in that area that the American tourists want to go and see or do. The hotel in Disco Bride is still not really stepped up to the mark. Uh, you know, the cafes are pretty poor. And if you go on a Tuesday, everything's closed. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, I think that there's some very good, there's some very good ideas there. Um, but there are many things that should be replicated, like Fife Contemporary Art and Crafts, or the, you know, some of the open studios have proliferated throughout Scotland. Many areas now run open studios for artists and craftspeople. But the challenge for me is, if somebody says, um, "I'm going to Dumfries in June," and I say, "Sorry, the open studios were in May." I don't know where they go to see craft. So it's getting that all year round uh -huh. presence, uh, yeah. engaging with the galleries that exist to try and have something on an ongoing basis. Yeah. So, um, so why does craft town? Should it, I think I mean, craft town could be. It uh -huh. could be a model for other for other small towns, mm -hmm. but it would need the energy of an individual to right. really make it happen. So, is there no funding that can help that, uh, or the you know if there was a group of individual? Well, that's a sort of contradiction but yeah. you know if there was a group of craft people who wanted to exhibit collectively but you know is there not that assistance there for, for a group they could apply through the the open funding to creative scotland um if they they found a venue um, i'm sure through the project funding um Craft in Scotland got most of its money through heritage lottery funding, uh, and you know, so it was large. It was large sums of money. It was millions and, and millions. Joint studio complexes exist around the country. Um, Wasp Studios, for example, have been going for a long time. Uh, there's now a number of independent studios. There must be about 50 studio complexes throughout the country where artists and makers come together. For makers, the challenge is that four blank walls doesn't really do it for them. They need access to equipment. They need access to a kiln. They, they need access mm -hmm. to cutting materials. They need, you know, there's, there's a number of different specialist things. So I think um, models like an equivalent of the printmakers' workshops, which were set up for printmakers and are in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, Dunfermline, wherever, um, you know, that would be perhaps a, a better model, so it's studio space with equipment would work better. But some of that energy has to come from within the sector itself. You know, it can't be top down, it also has to be bottom up. If people want it to happen, I think that, you know, there are some ways of, of making it happen. Yeah, so, but you know, there again, you're talking about, there, there is the facilities there, you know, and there are studios for, you know, kilns. Yeah. And so it just seems that there's this lack is that there are, there's no one to bring it together. Or do people actually know that they are available? I think that, I think the, the well, 
students coming out of college, it's always a, a challenge as to the next step. And although I think the colleges are quite good at giving some information, I think the students' head are just too full of producing their degree show. Uh, and so any training, they, they suddenly find themselves out, you know, and what, what do I do? The, the, there is information on our website, there's information on Creative Scotland's website about the, the studio spaces, but how to find funding is the bigger challenge for people, I think, how to get themselves set up in business. Most of them have to balance working part-time in a bar or, you know, doing any bits of teaching they can find to, to make themselves work. So it's, it's just it's a bit of a hard challenge as it is for any creative individual. And you also mentioned uh, in your introductory remarks about um, exporting and this involvement in the SDI. Yeah. And, um, so have you looked at collaborative working on that? Because... As part of our inquiry into exports, we've, you know, we've heard comments about you know, it's so difficult to, to get a container and you don't have enough goods to fill a container, but partly on that and they collaborate and they share the space in the container. So how much of that goes on in the craft industry? I don't think that there is a great deal at all. Um, it's something that we're starting to look at. That, to be fair, I think that in the last several years... Our organisation has focused more on the retail side of things rather than on the trade side, and it's a gap that I realise is there, and we're starting to turn our attentions to it, hence the trying to have the conversations with, with uh, SDI and UKTI. So certainly when we take the work overseas, we ship it jointly for all the artists so that that's easy for them, but I don't think that you've got individual people saying we're all going to New York to do the New York Now show in January. Does anyone else want to share the shipping? Mm -hmm. Most of them will take it, to be honest, as hand luggage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and you don't want to know how they get yeah, it. So you're not going to break it in the market. Uh, exactly. A of yeah. goods, but, uh, uh, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, John McAlpin. Oh, thank you very much, convener. Um, I'm a co-convener of the cross-party group on culture, and we had an evidence session on talent retention uh, about six weeks ago. Um, one of the stuff that came, the thing that came through quite strongly was this, the support, uh, the business support for artists, and this would apply, I think, to games and, and to your own sector, Fiona. The, the Artists' Union uh, had conducted a survey of their members and found that 78% of artists did their own negotiating. And a musician that we took evidence from talked about how the, the, weren't the management structure in Scotland and the specialist lawyers, for example, music lawyers, um, they just don't exist in Scotland and that means that people have to leave. And I wondered what you thought um, of those findings and what we could do to address them. Interestingly, I, the way I see it is that a lot of makers are attracted to come to Scotland here. Very interestingly, out of the 13 people that I took over to Chicago, there were probably only three who were actually born and bred and, and fully educated in Scotland. The other people have all either come into Scotland to study uh, and stayed here or because of the quality of life. So we had two South Koreans, we had uh, a, an American who's about to, to take up British citizenship. Um, and so, you know, we had uh, and, and a large number of English people as well who've all moved north of the border because they actually see that the support here is better. So I'm actually seeing it the other way around. And um, uh, I mean, I know a lot of, of people here for postgraduate study will still look to London, to the, the Royal College, because they're probably, you know, they probably still see that as the holy grail of, of, of going there. But lots of them go there and, and come back. So I'm not sure that we are losing huge numbers of, of creative people in our sector. OK, Brian wants to come in and then Gillian. Yeah. Yeah. When, it comes to, when it comes to film and screen, I would say that uh, there's, there's, there's a huge talent drain. There, there, if you think of the amount of agents that operate in London, there are simply thousands of them. There isn't one in Scotland, you know. Film uh, and uh, creative industries, legal uh, firms. There's actually there's one in Scotland. There's one, one, um, one lady that, that that operates from home. Um, the rest are in in London. The the expertise has has gone. And how, how could we build that up? Obviously, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. If there was one thing that could improve that, we need to create an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, I, I think 
this, uh, this is part of a much bigger issue. Um, we have, in the game sector, we have more and more people coming out of our universities. We've got four universities and six colleges producing game-specific graduates at the moment. Aberty alone has 850, Gregor? Yep. Yeah. Um, but the number of large studios that can employ them has shrunk and almost vanished um, over the last 10 years. So the opportunities are now largely entrepreneurial, which brings us smack bang back to, you know, how do, we, how do you set up on your own? What is it that you need and what are the services that you need in order to grow your business and make it commercially viable? Um, I, again, we have a growing infrastructure in Scotland. There are a number of technology tools companies. We've got business services companies, public relations and marketing. So it is growing, but it's very much focused on the, it's these very, very small companies. So we don't really have anyone of a, a global profile. And with all of the people coming out of the large studios as they close or coming out of the universities, um, we're losing more and more of them to either other industries uh, overseas or they are staying and setting up on their own because we do have that initial kickstart through Business Gateway. But then we've got this whole uh, black hole. You know, OK, you're set up, you're a business, good luck. Um, and we need to, uh, as Gillian says, find a way of bringing people through and trying to make these companies commercially successful. Yeah, it needs to be very brief. We're very short of time. It's beyond the remit of the committee. But, um, yeah. but I mean, there's a footnote in, the, in, in my document, which, which, and it points out that when a, a lot of significant artists came to Scotland, their art school students came, and they were allowed to stay for two years. And they, because they were here for one year plus two, it means they, could, they, they made connections, they were part of the infrastructure, and they made a val important contribution. And now they're, no long, now, now they're not allowed to stay for those additional two years. They come for one year and they leave, and they make, they make a significantly less important contribution, but also less of them will come, which will be damaging to the universities. Last point, which is a bit, the film fits into that category as well. And just to flag up Duncan Campbell, who's an artist who comes from the art school, from the MFA um, programme, and he's nominated for the, for, the, for, the, for the Turner Prize. So the thing about film is that it is at the commercial end, but it's also at the kind of Turner, Turner Prize end as well. Gregor, are you keen to make a point? I think we, you know, we retain a, a number of graduates for some of the reasons that Brian described, and because there is a talent pool within Dundee in particular of, of games graduates, and so there is a... Uh, richness to that that community that, that can support the the industry, but just to flag up something that that may become an issue in the future is this, uh, this sort of financial time bomb of fees south of the border. This is the first year graduates I think that will be leaving graduating from university with that extended amount of debt. That's going to put upward inflation on salaries in all of these sectors and and the game sector, and uh, it's going to make south of the border look much more attractive. Uh, to graduates because of that. Okay, um, Richard Baker. The film strategy against, because obviously that's just been launched, as Gillian Berry was saying, but it sounds to me from what you're saying that needs to change radically, even at its outset, if it's going to, if it's going to succeed. We have a strategy. Mm -hmm. We've not had one for a long time, so we're delighted to have one. However, given that there is market failure in the, in the sector, it is a government concern, and, and you know, perhaps it requires an intervention. And in terms of just government and public funding support for the industry in Scotland, I mean, how does that compare with the, even the, the UK as a whole? Because you said Northern Ireland, obviously, is a specific uh, level of investment, but how do we compare to other parts of the country? you got yes. any kind of feel well, for that? Well, if you look at um, Northern Ireland, it's about uh, 12 million. Southern Ireland is about 17. And then uh, uh, Denmark, 65 million. It's gone up. It's probably 70-something by now. Um, yeah, we're we're at the we're at the we're at the very bottom, and the problem is that the money just goes into production and development. Um, uh, you know, we were delighted to see that uh, the exhibition uh, received some some money from the regular funding a couple of weeks ago, um, but it's 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 de completely dependent on on uh, the supply of production. Otherwise, the exhibitor, exhibitors will just be um, exploiting international films. We need to be working on our own products. Just finally, I know in general you say that there's much more activity in film production in Ireland and Northern Ireland and other places because of the level of their investment. I mean, so, I mean, is it just a general assumption that if we invested more, we get that level of activity here? Or are there any specific examples you can think of where we've lost out on 
you know, we could a, have had Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, yeah. We mm-hmm. could have had Paul McGuigan's Frankenstein here. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, you know, everybody, everybody has a look at Scotland, but we've we've no studio. There's no there's no incentive fund apart from the the UK tax credit. Um, so they, you know, they go where the incentives are. A lot we, more economic impact. Yeah, if we, we have. Made that investment. I mean, it's it's just shocking the amount that we've lost out on. But you know, it's not it's not the end of the world. If we get our act together quickly, then 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 we can participate. You know. Thank you very much. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Kendall. There seems to be an emerging theme that we uh, uh, you know, that's come out of the discussion, and it's about um, a, a kind of disconnect between. Um, uh, the creative industry and the conventional mindset of business, and perhaps a further one between the public sector agencies who are tasked to facilitate or assist creative industries. And I just wonder if, um, in attempting to bridge these gaps, we're perhaps not being creative enough in terms of our business models or business structures. I was interested, for instance, in what Gillian said about a cooperative approach, and it just strikes me that. Um, that may be the right model, it may not. I mean, there may be other models we could look at, but, you know, I can imagine the scenario where we've got 50 creative people, an accountant and maybe a couple of lawyers within a business entity. I just wondered how much scope there is for taking things forward in that kind of sense, rather than attempting uh, to, you know, train every creative person so that he's a kind of part-time accountant as well. Be, I think it could be very easily done, Mike. The, the, you know, we 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 did um, some analysis um, on you know the Danish film industry and and uh, bigger production companies around the world and and, and their infrastructure. Uh, we looked at factual drama, animation, um, some games companies as well, and we tried to divide, uh, uh, define exactly what their infrastructure looked like, and then we asked all of our members uh, what they specifically needed and matched the two. So we, we tried to create a super infrastructure um, that that uh, put in place in the centre of the industry could give everybody um, a shared access, but could very quickly transform. Now, I think that the, the, the model needs some uh, development, but absolutely, if we thought creatively about it, that we could, we could, there could be a catch-all mechanism for for the creative industry. So, if we need to be creative of our business models, can that is that applicable to other cent- uh, sectors, the craft sector, for instance? I was, uh, you, you know, I thought Fiona. I mean, I, I sort of try and imagine the young Picasso talking to Business Gateway, Scottish <laughs> Enterprise, Creative Scotland, instead of talking to Gertrude Stein. Um, and I fear that we might have lost a great artist in the process. Yeah. Um, you know, other other clever creative business models that we can apply that can move the craft sector on. I'm not so sure about business models, but you're right about the the training and who they speak to. And I think Georgina said mentioned mentoring earlier. Um, some makers have tried to go through business gateway training, there is the cultural enterprise office, but they don't always speak the language, they don't always really understand the, the challenges of the, the individual sector. Um, so to address that, one of the things that we've been doing recently has been working with the Crafts Council in England to have s- some very good schemes aimed both at emerging makers, a scheme called Hot House, which is for people one to three years out of college, and another one called Injection, which is for more established makers who want to start up and then develop their business. And that's run by people who, uh, you know, using makers who've already established their business, decided where they want to go. And so we couldn't run it ourselves. We don't have the economy of scale to do that. And that's beginning, that's started this year, and I hope that that will roll out and become more successful And because it's more tailored for makers. Final question, can we, because I know we're running out of time, and I've, I've saved the most important one for last. I'm sure you're all aware of the Smith Commission. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that the Scottish Government, fairly soon, we hope, will have some tax raising powers, or perhaps a lot of tax raising powers. Um, uh, in, 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 t- in terms of how we use, use those powers, um, can you see opportunities where we can creatively assist the creative industry? Yes. Yeah. If there was uh, an ability to increase the tax credit in, in Scotland for incoming um, Production and for indigenous production, I think I think that would have a ph- phenomenal effect immediately. Okay, 
Good. Right. Uh, thank you very much. With impeccable timing, that brings us to the end of our session. It's been a, I think I speak for all members when I say it's been absolutely fascinating. I, I really sense we've only skimmed the surface of, of the topic. There's a lot more issues that we could follow up on them on what the committee will have to do is look at the evidence we've we've heard today and consider how we might take some of this forward in future but in the meantime i'm very grateful to you all for uh, the time you've given in coming along today and presenting your evidence thank you uh, and we will now have a short uh, suspension
Okay, we have it here. <coughs> yes. Okay. Right. Um, if we can uh, reconvene, uh, item three on our agenda, we have two draft instruments uh, to uh, consider. We have the uh, Land Register of Scotland Automated Registration Etc. Regulations 2014 in draft, and the Land Registration Etc. Uh, Scotland Act 2012 Amendment and Transitional Order 2014 in draft. And I'd like to welcome uh, this morning. Uh, Fergus Ewing, Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism, who's joined by uh, Hugh Welsh, Head of Data at Registers of Scotland, uh, Grant Hall, uh, Head of 2012 Act Implementation at Registers of Scotland, and Kirsten Simone Lefebvre, Solicitor, Registers of Scotland. Welcome to you all. Minister, do you want to introduce these instruments? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Kavira. Good morning to everyone. I'm pleased to uh, have been invited by the committee to speak to these two instruments. They are the final part of a suite of subordinate legislation that needs to be in force for the designated day for the land registration, ETC Scotland Act 2012, and that is the 8th of December this year. On that day, the new scheme of land registration provided for in the 2012 Act will come into force. This will bring into effect a fairer and more efficient system of land registration for the people of Scotland and will provide the technical tools necessary to enable completion of the land register. The instruments the committee are considering today, uh, which I think are narrow in scope, convener, will provide further practical details on what requires to be in place to ensure the smooth introduction of that new scheme of land registration. Registers of Scotland has been operating a computer system to register electronic deeds in the Land Register of Scotland since 2008. The system is called Automated Registration of Title to Land and is commonly known as ARTO. Over 90,000 deeds have been registered using that system. It allows solicitors, institutional lenders and local authorities to register electronically certain deeds that affect land register titles. ARTL applications attract an abated fee, reflecting the lower cost of processing such applications, and this has saved those transacting with property in Scotland in the region of £11 million in registration fees since introduced in 2008. ARTL has its legislative basis in certain amendments to the Land Registration Scotland Act 1979 and the requirements of writing Scotland Act 1995, those amendments are repealed by the Land Registration Scotland Act 2012 on the designated day, but the 212 Act contains specific powers to enable automated registration to continue from that date. These powers are being used in the regulations under discussion today to maintain a continuing legislative basis for ARTO. Registers of Scotland intend to continue to operate ARTO from the designated day, 8th December, and these regulations do not change any of the policies that underpin the system. The ARTL system has been modified to reflect the new scheme of land registration provided for by the 212 Act. The regulations under discussion restate current policy and practice to ensure that ARTL remains a secure system for electronic registration of deeds. This includes Regulation 4, which sets out the duties on authorised persons using ARTL including the requirement for an identity verification meeting between registers of Scotland and the person representing the organisation before they can start using ARTO. Regulation 9 amends the Electronic Documents Scotland Regulations, which, amongst other things, introduces the new Regulation 6, which makes continued provision to make it competent to register electronic documents in the Land Register of Scotland, provided that such a document meets certain technical requirements. It states that the electronic signature applied to such a document must be supplied by the Keeper and certified by the Keeper's public key infrastructure. Once embedded in a digital deed, the digital signature provides proof that the document has not been altered since it was signed, who it was signed by, and when it was signed. This ensures the security of the system. It is important to make it clear that this SSI does not generally allow registration of electronic documents. The fees for ARTL have been set separately by the Registers of Scotland Fees Order 214, which has previously been considered by this committee. I am delighted to say that the fees were maintained at their current levels, and in August this year I announced that the statutory registration fees charged by Registers of Scotland 
will be frozen until at least April 2017, maintaining registration fees at the same level since 2011. The Land Registration Scotland Act 2012 Amendment and Transitional Order 2014 is mainly technical in nature and provides amendments to the 212 Act in addition to some consequential amendments to other legislation. As these amendments are technical, I would not propose to go through the details of these amendments in this statement, but in conclusion, Convener, I will of course uh, be happy, together with the assistance of my officials, I suspect, to take any question that the committee has on this order. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, do any members have any uh, points uh, they want to make or questions they want to ask in relation to these instruments? Just very briefly, uh, sorry, Dennis Robertson. Uh, yes, just sorry. very briefly, Minister, with regard to the fees, uh, you've mentioned that they're, they're frozen to April uh, 2017. Um, were you lobbied in, in respect of keeping the fees or is this something you decided that it was good for the uh, 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 registration and obviously good uh, in terms of um, it, it, it was an incentive to, to move forward in, in this respect? Uh, we, we are aware of uh, general um, desire amongst the, the, the property sector, domestic and commercial, of the need to be competitive, the need to maintain costs at uh, uh, as realistic and low a level as possible, uh, and therefore um, we took uh, that those general views into account. Uh, as a government, we are also keen to make sure that uh, property transactions in Scotland, as well as uh, being registered in a professional and, and effective and swift fashion by the keeper, whose performance has massively increased uh, since I left practice, I, I'm sure that's a coincidence, um, that uh, the financial burden of costs should be kept to a minimum and also that there be certainty as to fees. So I was pleased that we were able to confirm fees at these levels, uh, at the current levels, 2011 levels until 2017 and that decision was one which was taken after very careful consideration, convener of quite complex considerations relating to levels of reserves and other matters I think which we've discussed before and with the full cooperation, assistance and agreement of uh, the keeper. Thank you. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Convener. I would just like to um, ask the committee just to recollect for a minute that it was this committee that did the scrutiny on the, the Land Registration Scotland Act that the Minister referred to, and we were broadly supportive of the aims and intent purpose of the Act. Um, we welcomed it, um, and I would uh, wish to place on record my welcome for these um, final two statutory instruments that will complete the process of um, uh, facilitating convincing in Scotland and making the whole system fit for purpose in the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Thank you. Um, I don't think any other members wish to speak. Uh, yes, Mr. Burton. Yes. Good morning. Just very briefly, um, as I recall, and, and I agree with, with Mike McKenzie, as I recall it, uh, we had some lengthy discussions around the computer system. I see Regulation 3 uh, provides for the persons authorised to use what I understand to be a new system. I is that the case? Um, Perhaps Mr Welsh? No, it's, the, it's still the same system. Um, it's reinstating the same policy. There's a few minor tweaks to it. The main difference is there's less questions. It's basically in line with the, um, the LR Act 2012. So it'll be the same system. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, if nobody else has questions, I just wanted to observe that the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have uh, indicated to us uh, that uh, uh, they are content uh, with the wording uh, of both uh, of these uh, instruments, uh, and we've also not received any uh, representation from any external bodies in relation to these. Okay, that being the case, we can move on to uh, item four uh, on the agenda, and I invite the Minister, if you would, to move motions S4M115. One zero uh, and S four M one one five one one. So moved. Thank you, uh, Minister. Okay. Do any members wish to uh, speak in relation to uh, these motions? Uh, no. In that case, I think we can just move to put the questions. Uh, the uh, the question is that uh, motion uh, S four M. One one five zero 
uh, be uh, passed. This is in relation to the Land Registration of Scotland, Automated Registration, etc. Regulations 2014 in draft. Are we agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. And the second is motion S4M11511 that we recommend that the Land Registration, etc. Scotland Act 2012, Amendment and Traditional Order 2014 in draft be approved. Are we agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Uh, thank you. Minister, and thank you to your officials, and uh, uh, I should also, oh yes, I need to uh, ask uh, the committee if they are content that uh, the convener and clerk produce a short factual report of the committee's decisions and arrange to have that published. Agreed. That is agreed. Uh, thank you, Minister. It just, it just uh, falls to me to mention, as this may be your last visit to the committee, who knows, in your, in your current position, to uh, wish you success over the coming days. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> which I think is a very constructive note, so I will accept it in that spirit. Um, and it has, been, it has been a pleasure, of course. Thank you, and for us, of course. Thank you very much, and with that, we will suspend briefly and go into private session.